It's Wednesday, September 25th, 2013, and this is the Arizona Mining Review. I'm Lee Allison, your host here at the Arizona Geological Survey in Tucson. And joining us today, as usual, is our Chief Economic Geologist, Niall Nemeth, calling in from Phoenix. Niall, good morning and welcome to the show. Good morning, Lee. Hey, I hear um, there's been some developments with the in-situ copper project up in the Miami area. Uh, can you fill us in on what you know? Yeah, we've been waiting for a, a property as an acquisition to close, and finally we've seen that happen. A company by the name of Copper Fox has completed the acquisition back in April, and more recently, in the middle of August, they've announced that thanks to a joint venture on a property up in Canada that's freed up some resources to let them begin doing a compilation on a oh, large number of drill holes, I think about 70 plus drill holes on the Van Dyke in situ leach. It's also going to free up some resources to work on a uh, property in the Copper Creek District, Sombrero Butte. Okay, and so for those of our viewers who may not have been following this very closely, the in situ is the idea we they drill wells into the deposit and they pump down a very weak uh, acidic solution that, that basically dissolves the, uh, the copper out of the rock and then brings it back up in additional wells. And so you're not really mining in the traditional sense, right? That's correct. It leaves uh, you know the surface almost undisturbed other than a few locations of the uh, the drill pads for the drill holes. The other project uh, that's that's trying to move forward in Arizona uh, using in situ is in the Florence region, and that's been caught up because it's so close to the town and to some real estate development. There's been a lot of controversy in holding it up, but I suspect this being up in the Miami area, which is a really uh, center of of the mining industry in in Arizona, that. Uh, the, uh, it, they may not run into some of the same kinds of problems. Do you have a sense of that? Well, let's hope not. Uh, several decades ago, when the property was operated or controlled by Occidental, uh, there had been a controversy. Uh, there have been some earlier presentations by the prior group that had uh, held the property, uh, Bell Copper, and from those, they would gotten the support of both the town council and the mayor, so hopefully that support will continue. Well, moving, uh, changing topics here a little bit, I heard uh, that there's some uh, developments, favorable developments for the Red Hawk uh, project. Yeah, Red Hawk's been drilling away for a number of years up in the Copper Creek district, uh, northeast of Tucson, and they've finally been uh, starting to advance that project. So they've got a new uh, uh, preliminary economic assessment out? They do. They had a, uh, a Tucson uh, firm Colin Nicholas, along with Golder, uh, do some of the, uh, and, and Milne Engineering, do some of the preliminary uh, work, and they've come up with a pretty positive uh, situation. Looking at uh, a base price of about $1.75 copper and an 18-year underground mine life, they uh, see a quite profitable situation doing about 25,000 tons per day, which would end up uh, producing about 120 million pounds of copper per year. Okay, and that sounds like a fairly conservative price estimate. So even with the uh, the pullback in global commodity prices, that looks like it would still be uh, in the positive economic range. Yeah, that, that includes some Mali uh, byproduct credits, but you're certainly right. that They've gone with a pretty conservative estimate, and given the volatility that we've seen, I think that's a, a good approach, especially for the preliminary analysis. Wow, okay. Um, I think the big news uh, around town here in Tucson this week has been the uh, Forest Service announcement that they're going to delay the release of the final environmental impact statement on the Rosemont Copper Mine. And it was due to come out by September 27th. Uh, Forest Service now says November. But what does that actually mean? Well, we'll see what that means. But there was, some, uh, there was an announcement of some additional regulations by uh, Supervisor Jim Upchurch, and those are quite troubling. Well, as, yeah, as I understand it, the, the Forest Service rules change uh, on September 27th, so they were hoping originally to get uh, all of this done under the existing rules, but that if it was pushed back or pushed uh, past uh, September 27th, the new rules would then take effect. So it sounds like by postponing it till November, it now puts it under the jurisdiction of the new rules. So what's your assessment of what that's going to mean? Well, the, the announcement of those new rules uh, is that they're allowing for an additional 120-day period for resolution of concerns. 
And given the, the contentious nature of the project, uh, we'll probably see a number of those issues raised and uh, there's already been discussion that it may indeed consume all that 120 days. Right. Given the, the amount of controversy and, and the uh, issues being raised by the opponents, that's probably not unexpected. Yeah, the, the only good news is hopefully the, that 120 period will really allow some of those uh, issues to be resolved and not end up in uh, further uh, post-issuance of the uh, record of decision lawsuits. So maybe we can eliminate some of those future delays. We'll have to see what, if the Forest Service is successful with that. Okay, great. Niall, as usual, thanks. You've always got all the inside dope, and uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again in the next episode. Enjoy being here, Lee. Thank you. All right, take care. Well, joining us now is Greg Lucero, Vice President of Sustainability for Wildcat Silver. Greg, thanks for coming on. Hey, my pleasure, Lee. It's uh, great to be here this morning. Well, great. Uh, Vice President of Sustainability, that's an unusual title, isn't it? It's a new title for the mining industry. It's a new title. I guess it's a catch-all title because it really deals with the community relations and government uh, interactions. So. I primarily deal with, with uh, local government, state, federal, um, and then on the community level I deal with local business leaders, uh, nonprofit organizations, and just the general public. So uh, I'm, the, I'm basically the face person uh, for the company in, okay. in, in the community. Okay. You've got a long history of being in this area. I'm a native Arizonan. I uh, was born in Douglas which was at one time the western headquarters for Phelps Dodge. Grew up uh, okay. uh, seeing the, uh, the smelter of Phelps Dodge as it processed ore from, from Bisbee. So, uh, you know, strong uh, background in mining and mining influence uh, in the community. So, uh, grew up there uh, and ended up graduating from the University of Arizona. Didn't okay. stray too far and uh, was immersed in, in government. Uh, have worked for the Tucson uh, City Council, City Manager, Pima County government, uh, state of Arizona, uh, worked for uh, Congressman McNulty, uh, I worked for Governor B Bruce Babbitt, uh, you know, Senator D Dennis DeConcini, and uh, then decided to go into government myself and uh, worked in various communities throughout the state and eventually ended up in Santa Cruz County as uh, the county manager and left there and now working for Wildcat Silver, okay. dealing with local government. Fantastic. Well, that's great. So, you know the issues and the concerns that are being raised by some of the folks in the Patagonia area about a major mine coming in. Yes, uh, I do. And what's interesting is uh, the, the uh, uh, Hermosa project, which is, I think, your flagship project down there, was actually discovered in 1896, and, they, and they've mined it. Uh, at least a small amount of mining has gone on there for a long time. Yeah, since, since the 18th century there's been extensive mine workings throughout the area. It's, it's a mineral rich environment. Patagonia itself uh, it was, was founded because of mining, as were a lot of communities in southern Arizona. So uh, yeah, they're, they're, uh, the Hermoso project has, has been there for a, a long time. It, it's uh, high grade silver. Uh, most of the good stuff was taken early. Uh, the stuff that uh, we're now looking at is a little bit further down and uh, further down you mean deeper deep deeper in, in, yeah. into the into the surface and uh, up until I guess uh, the, the mid 1960s it was uh, owned and operated by Asarco and um, the, the biggest problem in, in trying to extract the ore was water it's there's a, a lot of water in that area uh, contrary to what many opponents have, have been stating that, that uh, we're just going to uh, bleed the area of water. We, we got probably the opposite uh, position that we're probably going to be uh, water long, so we're, we're going to have to deal with how to, how to get water out of the way of, of our mining oh, so operation. So you're going to have a lot of water coming out of the operation that you're going to have to find a place to send Store. It. Right. Okay. Well, some of the numbers that I've heard you uh, present and, and uh, the others in the company suggest this could be one of the biggest silver mines in the U.S. That, that is our hope and goal. Uh, when we took over the project, uh, probably in uh, mid-2000, I, I think uh, the resource was somewhere about 50 million ounces of silver. Mm. Uh, since then, with uh, extensive drilling on our private property, we, we've increased the resource to uh, about 315 million ounces of silver, so it, it is a sizable resource. Uh, 
this resource also extends out into, into the Forest Service. Uh, and that, that is uh, where our, the, the project really gets big. It, it becomes pretty much unlimited at that point because it expands in all directions. Uh, we've also increased our unpatented mining claims because of that. Uh, when we uh, first submitted our, our original plan of operations to the Forest Service, I think we had roughly about 5,000 acres of unpatented claims. We have ourselves about 154 acres of, of uh, patented claims. Mm -hmm. Our unpatented claims have doubled. We're probably uh, approaching about uh, 15,000 acres and we're still looking at expanding our, our area. Well, I know you have some new drilling that you've proposed, so is this to continue to step out and expand the, the scope? Uh, the not project? really. Uh, we've got enough of a resource now that we feel that we're confident enough to, to move forward with the development of, of a mine. But to get to that, that step, we need to gather additional data. So we're, we're looking at the data that is going to be required to address environmental issues as well as, as uh, mining issues. We need to get a better handle on, on the water. Uh, there is no water data uh, in our area. Oh. So okay. uh, the, the, the drilling that we're proposing is to, in fact, uh, encircle the area uh, with water monitoring wells uh, so we can start doing water quality uh, testing and uh, water quantity uh, uh, testing to get an idea of the quantity and quality of the water. We're also looking at uh, subsoil uh, uh, drilling to get an idea of, of the of soil conditions below the surface. Uh, we need to get a handle on, you know, where are we going to store waste rock, where are we going to store uh, tails, uh, get a handle on, on uh, the plant site, you know, can it support the facility. So those, those are the things that we're looking at. Uh, the other thing we're looking at is, is uh, drilling some or, or putting in some test pits. Uh, we're looking at trying to get uh, a good idea of clay resource in the area, which would help us with, with our uh, plan for uh, tails, if we can get a, oh, a, a, okay. a good a clay resource in the area, it certainly would uh, be a cost saver and, uh, to have us from having to, to ship clay into... To and that would be used for the liner for... Yeah, absolutely, okay. and, it, it, and it's it's just a part of the liner. We will have sure. a, a, an industrial uh, uh, mesh fiber, it'll probably be two layers, so uh, yeah, the, the clay is, is part of the, the liner that's needed for for the uh, tails. Okay. Now, my understanding is you've been doing some testing, and, and in the testing, there's a, you're producing some copper as a byproduct. Well, uh, we, we know we've got a lot of silver, uh, as I've already stated. We also have a lot of other metals. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a little bit of gold. Uh, we've got uh, a good good amount of copper. Uh, we've got a good amount of zinc. We've got a good amount of manganese, and uh, we've we've got some lead that that oh. it is problematic. Uh, so what we've done is, is we've pretty much refined the, the, the flow sheet for the silver. We're now looking at, at uh, the other metals and coming up with uh, cost feasible flow sheets to process those other metals. Uh, the, the one that's the, that has been the biggest challenge has been manganese. Um, right now manganese it is a U.S. strategic metal. Uh, it's used uh, to strengthen steel, it's used to, to uh, strengthen aluminum, it's used for batteries. 100% uh, of the manganese uh, that's used in the United States is imported. Right. Uh, we are looking to be the only producer of manganese uh, for U.S. consumption. The, the problem has been uh, this manganese is, is not an easy right. <laughs> mineral to, to, to extract, so we've, we've got uh, the steps down to, to develop a manganese con. Uh, we're now con. looking a uh, concentrate. Okay. <laughs> uh, so now we're looking at uh, uh, make it into a higher grade, a manganese metal. Uh, manganese metal is, is, is a, a very attractive product in the U.S. and could pretty much be sold anywhere in the world. Unfortunately, the, the cost to produce it is, is something that we've been tinkering with. We are, we've been really close to, to completing a, a pre-feasibility analysis of, of the project, which is you know, one of the steps that's needed in, in developing a, a mining project. That's for the overall project for silver, not just for the manganese Correct. piece of it. Yeah, yeah so uh, the, the last component has been uh, tinkering with, with this manganese uh, mm -hmm. process flow sheet. So. Our hope is that uh, 
here in the next uh, few weeks we can get that resolved. We can get our, our pre-fees out. Uh, about uh, that time we'll hopefully get our permit to, to do this additional drilling on the Forest Service to give us the data that we would need to move forward with the development of a mine plan. Our expectation is that uh, we would get our, our drilling permit sometime April, May of next year, drill for three to four months, and probably by the uh, end of 2014 come back with, with a mine plan mm. and start the, the whole environmental permitting process to, to put a mine in place. And that would be county, state, and federal permitting? that you'd have to work with? Well, uh, because we're in rural Arizona, uh, we would only have to deal with the state and, okay. and, the, and the federal government. Uh, okay. air, air quality issues are uh, would be handled in, by the state of Arizona. Okay. If we're in Pima County, uh, we'd have to deal with, with Pima County. Uh, but uh, because we're uh, rural Arizona, uh, it's just the state and the federal. Okay, so they, they've asked the state to kind of handle that or basically take the jurisdiction. Yeah, it, it is the state's jurisdiction okay. in this case. Okay. So uh, there, there, really, uh, there really isn't any local government involvement whatsoever in our permitting mm -hmm. process. So okay. we will work with the local governments, uh, obviously because they've got uh, concerns over uh, water, traffic, et cetera. So yeah. This could be a very big project for that region. Yeah, Economically, uh, impacts in many ways. Yeah, if, if you look at, at Santa Cruz County in comparison with all the, the, the counties in, in Arizona, it is the poorest of the poor. I mean, it, it is uh, ranks at the bottom for, for poverty, uh, high unemployment. Uh, if you look at per capita spending on higher education, it, it's again at the bottom. A project like, like ours would be a, a tremendous economic and social mm -hmm. uh, boost for, for the community. Uh, we're looking at probably creating somewhere in the area of 200 to 350 jobs. Average salary is probably going to be in the range of about 70, 75,000. Wow. So it, it's it's going to be a tremendous impact in, that, in the area. That's about twice what the statewide average is for. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it, okay. it, it's going to be a, it's going to be a big, big uh, uh, boom for, for the community. Well, if everything goes the way you would hope it goes and you don't run into any major problems, how soon could you be mining? Well, uh, my boss asks, asks me that question all the time, Greg, how soon can you get us the permits? And <laughs> I, I always try to be optimistic, but, but it doesn't hurt to be a little pessimistic because sure. you got to head, hedge your bets. So uh, I, I, I am hoping to, to get our permits by the uh, uh, latter part of 2018. Okay. Realistically, it'll probably be closer to t 2020. Uh, okay which means uh, we get our permits and then we have to go through all, all the uh, uh, construction uh, process and you're probably looking at an 18 month time frame and then we'll hmm. probably get into production uh, probably late 2021, 2022, somewhere in that time frame. Okay. And unfortunately it's it's just the, the environmental permitting process that, that is the, 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 the time constraint. That's not unusual. I think uh, I was just in Washington DC and meeting with uh, uh, congressional staffers and the Mining Association and others and they're saying seven to ten years is fairly typical for getting permits and approvals for any kind of mining operation anywhere in the country. Now. And that, that's probably the, the, the one thing that people just don't understand is there are no time limits once you get into the permitting process. It, it, it can go on infinitum so it, it's it's something that you know, people in the mining industry would like to see at least put some time limits on the permitting process, not not circumventing any of the, the rules or regulations or requirements, but, you know, once you get a permit in, the, the agency has, you know, X number of months or a year to, to, to process it. Uh, right now, once you get into the queue, it's, you don't know when you're going to get out. Right, okay. Uh, perfect example is if you look at Rosemont, uh, you know, their expectation was that they were going to get their record of decision this month. Uh, rules change, now the Forest Service is saying probably sometime in November. Uh, who's to say that that's going to uh, change again? Mm -hmm. Creates a lot of uncertainty. Very well, and, and, and the thing that uh, people need to understand is these aren't private companies. They're, they're investor-owned companies, and investors want to see a return on their investment. So. Uh, it's very difficult to keep the investment community interested in a project when the permitting process grinds to a halt. Right. If you've got some money, take it somewhere else where the business is actually going to get going in some time, 
Absolutely, and, and Arizona has unfortunately become uh, a state that is, is starting to be viewed in a negative light when it comes to permitting. Okay. Good luck on the permitting for the, your next round of wells. We're really uh, looking forward to see the results from those. So are we. Yes, uh, it seems like every time you drill you find more silver, more resource. Uh, it's just, uh, as you said, it just seems to be going on forever. So well, I think I'll, I'll, hopefully I'll be back, Lee, and I'll, I'll yes. update you then. Right, that would be great. Thanks very much. Thank you, Lee. Okay. Well, two years ago, the Arizona Department of Mines and Mineral Resources was merged with the Arizona Geological Survey. And with that, we discovered we had decades and decades worth of historical mining files and maps and photos and slides uh, that filled rooms. And so with the support of the governor and the legislature, we're now going through and digitizing, scanning all of those records, all of the maps and the photos, and putting them online for free download. So joining us now from Phoenix is Casey Brown, our digital librarian, who's heading up that project. Casey, welcome this morning. And let me ask you the first question. Why is it so important to, to preserve these old historical records? Well, probably the primary reason I would say it's important for us to be doing this is that it's one of the few publicly available uh, mineral property uh, collections. Um, there are a couple of others that um, there are other significant collections within the state, say at the State Archives or at Charlotte Hall or at the Historical Society, um, but none of them are exploration and mineral focused the way that the collections that came from the Department of Mines and Minerals uh, by, by their nature. Um, it's also important that, that we preserve these files because of the boom and bust nature of the uh, mining industry. When uh, geologists retire or a company closes, uh, a lot of exploration uh, data can just end up in a garage or even end up uh, as trash to uh, somebody who doesn't know what they're looking at. Um, and these can be highly valuable for the next company that comes along. So it's important that we keep these uh, as part of the public good, um, considering that Arizona is the number one mining state uh, in the nation, um, and that if we're not the ones that are mining these materials, uh, then we're reliant on um, somewhere else to, to be providing those raw materials. Okay, Casey, my understanding is that uh, there's the Department of Mines and Mineral Resources collection of of files and maps that they had acquired over many, many years, but there's also quite a few collections that were donated by retired geologists, by companies, by others. And so can you describe the ADMMR collection and how that compares to the many, many other collections that you're looking at up there? Sure. Um, you'll probably hear me use the ADMMR mining collection. Um, it as the primary collection that was created by uh, staff engineers um, or, or other staff members. Um, and, and that specifically is about 50 drawers worth of content. Uh, uh, a file cabinet drawers is? File cabinet drawers, they're about a foot, foot and a half um, if they're full. Um, and, but in total we have um, on about, I believe it's 30 collections um, a couple of other significant collections. Um, James Doyle Sell uh, worked for Sarco for many years, and uh, his collection is quite sizable, um, several filing cabinets. Um, and also the Heinrichs brothers, so Walt Heinrichs um, and Grover Heinrichs of the Heinrichs Geo Exploration Company in Tucson, uh, discoverer of the uh, Pima mine in, uh, in Tucson south of Tucson, uh, we have all of uh, their data. And between those two, that probably makes up half of the content, um, half of the bulk in the collections. Um, and then but obviously with the numbers, so we have several other smaller collections. Um, Koval Caressus is probably one of the oldest ones. Mieritz, Mulkey. Okay. Well, how much stuff of this, how much stuff have you already scanned and digitized and put online, and how much is left to do? 
we started with the ADMMR collection, um, that primary collection that uh, most of the department's customers would oft most often ask for. Um, that amounted to just over 4,000 property files. Uh, they are locatable at places in Arizona, um, to some of them to the best of our knowledge. Um, but generally, we have it pinned down to within a half mile area. Um, with that collection um, came 2,300, I'm sorry, 3,300 photographs. Uh, those were mostly separated out from either reports that came into the office um, one at a time or, um, or were taken by the engineers during their field trips. Um, those appear as individual files uh, when you go look for them in the catalog. Um, and we managed to sneak in about 700 maps uh, from our flat map drawers. Uh, and that's currently the focus uh, of, of our work right now is to finish the flat map cabinets. Uh, I believe we're estimating that we'll have another 4,500 unique original maps uh, online in the in the catalog this year this year that's great well so that leads to the question of uh, how do people find these where do they go to get them uh, as you once you put them online well once they're online um, they can find them at search.usgen.org uh, usgen uh, aggregates lots of data from other agencies and and other earth science focuses uh, but our data is in there, and uh, we just recommend that if our customers are looking for, for these collections and um, mineral, uh, these mineral properties, that they start by prefixing a search with ADMMR, um, because that will narrow down their, their results, and then they can put in uh, a name of a property that they're looking for. Right, because USGEN, the U.S. Geologic or Geoscience Information Network, is actually a, a data integration platform that, that we're leading uh, the development on nationwide, but it's got vast amounts of data coming from all state geological surveys, and we're linking in with uh, other federal agencies uh, and a variety of different repositories. So uh, people looking for, for these uh, mining records uh, do need to take your advice and and, right, and use the key, the right keyword. My understanding is that uh, we're going to be uh, making a, a little more friendly user interface uh, over this next year, uh, so that there's more of a dedicated portal and, and people will be able to to come in without having to uh, to uh, be quite so sophisticated in their search. That's my understanding as well. So the the URL. Um, will probably change where where they can find these records um, and then they can know that they're really only looking at these collections and uh, they won't have to do as much prefixing or, or qualifying of their of their search terms hopefully it'll be a little bit more straightforward um, I would just also warn uh, someone that's trying to use the site that currently only the primary name of a mine is searched um, we do have in the data a lot of also known as um, titles for the mines um, and hope that that's a feature that we can get working when we have that new portal. Okay, well this is definitely a work in progress. Uh, you've made tremendous uh, progress on this. There's a lot more to do and there's a lot more we have to do here with our uh, uh, information technology staff to make sure that it, it once you have the material online it's easy to find and be able to search by keywords or or by drawing boxes on maps and seeing what's available in areas. So, Casey, thanks for joining us. We're going to look forward to uh, seeing more and more of these uh, mine records and files, uh, maps, and photos online. So, thanks. All right. Well, that wraps up our episode of Arizona Mining Review for September. I want to thank our production team. Our uh, producer today is our new intern from the University of Arizona, Jenna Favo. Uh, director Mike Conway, our technical support with uh, Ron Palmer, cameraman is Jordan Maddy, and our logo and set design done by Arnie Bermudez and Stephanie Marr. So thanks for joining us today. As usual, we uh, 
record this and put it up on our YouTube channel and you can see previous episodes of AMR there. So we look forward to seeing you next month on Arizona Mining Review.